So welcome everybody. Thanks uh, for being with us and uh, sorry for this uh, delay. We also have um, a lot of participants from Norway. So we will um, be addressing a new lecture series tonight called the Athenaeum lecture series. This is, um, I would just say a few things about that and then um, Dr. Zafiriad for time will introduce our speaker and we'll take it from there. Ateneum is a society of friends in Norway, and that was created back in 2019 to support the Institute and um, enhance its work in Norway. So in order for the students and for the academic environment to know more about the Institute, um, the Oslo University took the initiative to create an association backed up uh, by other friends, uh, a lot of um, personalities in Norway, academics who really supported the institute and thought it should be more known. At the same time, Greek-based research uh, should also uh, be enhanced in Norway. People should be more interested in coming to Greece and doing stuff. So for this reason, a grant was uh, established in uh, 2021, uh, 2021. And Axel uh, Breckman, um, a May, a May okay. student from uh, the University of Bergen in archaeology, was the first recipient. He was also a research affiliate here at the Institute. Um, and this was the way to introduce um, this new initiative. Now there is another grant for 2023 2024. So if you know anybody related to Norwegian University doing research there, just spread the word. Um, Peter um, Stuart Robinson has been a familiar face at NIA, at least uh, since the time I was here, like 10 years now, he has been supporting the Institute. I won't say much about his academic profile because the Salis will do that, but I would like to thank him very much for being with us. Um, thank you everybody from Ateneum for supporting us and um, initiating this uh, great uh, new structure at NIA and enjoy the lecture. Good afternoon. So, uh, and I also would uh, like to uh, send a warm welcome uh, both to our in-person and online attendees uh, to tonight's lecture, which uh, marks the commencement of the Athenaeum Lecture Series. Uh, building on what Delia mentioned, I'd like to acknowledge the significant role played by the Athenaeum Society. Uh, and Athenaeum's, Athenaeum's impact uh, extends not only to our institute, but uh, crucially to Norwegian university students of all levels, thanks to the generous funding opportunities it provides uh, to them for traveling in Greece for research purposes. So allow me here to emphasize again the importance of supporting the Ateneo as a means of nurturing the new generation of Norwegian scholars uh, in the humanities and social sciences. So tonight we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Uh, Peter Stuart Robinson, an active Ateneo member, a dear friend, and a truly charismatic uh, scholar and speaker, and you, you will figure this out in a bit. Uh, Stuart serves as an Associate Professor of Political Science at the Arctic University of Norway. Undeterred by Tromsø's uh, cold weather, he maintains a fervent, fervent interest in various research topics within the realm of political sciences, and also popularizing aspects of contemporary cinema. Equally important. Stuart earned his PhD in Political Science from the University of British Columbia, contributing extensively since then to theoretical work on political crisis. His recent research delves into the social dynamics of political continuity and change, particularly expressed in cultural fields and urban environments. Currently, he's working uh, on a project on crisis management and representation as political agency, focusing on divers diverse responses to Greek economic and migratory pressures. Among the pro pro projects he is or he was involved uh, with are the War and Peace Dynamics Project, Engaging Conflicts in Digital Era Project and the War and Peace Dynamics Project, exploring issues uh, and challenges related to war and peace studies. Rather than listing uh, Dr. Robinson's extensive and diverse publication record, I encourage you to explore it on his university webpage or ask him directly uh, during the reception uh, after the lecture. Allow me to a moment to share a personal anecdote uh, about how I, how I met Stuart. Uh, which is also a testament to his character and the breadth of his personal and academic interests. Some years ago, Stuart joined us uh, as a volunteer 
in the Gurmadi archaeological uh, excavation project, which I co direct, despite being a uh, political scientist, nobody's perfect, uh, <laughs> he exhibited a remarkable uh, interest, commitment, and professionalism in archaeological fieldwork. So, on behalf of the project, uh, we extend our gratitude to him for his invaluable contribution. And we're looking forward to hearing his impressions and memories from his involvement with archaeological fieldwork, even though if they're a bit traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, they're not. So, without further ado, uh, I'll now pass the microphone to Stuart to dig out the ties between Thucydides and the wild world of modern politics. Thank you. Wow, that was quite an introduction. Right, okay. Um, I better make the best of it now. Um, yeah, uh, I suppose just a little bit of context that uh, I have had an... I mean, one of the reasons I showed up at an archaeological dig, apart from just wanting to be helpful, obviously, was um, I'm interested in history, historiography, how we construct the past. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this interest actually has a lot to do with what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but um, I'll probably uh, spend more time talking about contemporary issues, which is maybe uh, a little bit implied if you look at the visual representation, which uh, produces something conveniently labelled uh, Thucydides' trap. And, well, if you pay close attention, you can see that basically you've got an American runner, um, and it's a little bit hard to say, but I would say what's happening here is that a Chinese runner is in the process of overtaking and without too much fidelity to the athletic rules, the American is attempting to hold the Chinese uh, back. So um, the point about this is uh, partly a point about Thucydides and the use of Thucydides. I'm going to say something about how I think, uh, speaking as an amateur Thucydides scholar, and I, I am an amateur, I am a political scientist, but nevertheless, I've probably been more deeply into Thucydides than a lot of my international relations scholars. Um, what I want to suggest is that... Um, some uh, kind of distorting views of Thucydides himself emerge. It's a kind of strange way of interpreting the text. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the way this whole kind of use of Thucydides contributes to um, a distorted way of understanding and operating in the world today. And, it, and it's not just doing that in a vacuum either. We're talking about a field, international relations, uh, that, you know, it has the ear of policymakers. It's a field dominated by Americans. It's a field that has gained over the years a reputation for generating easy to understand practical policy advice that policymakers in the United States take seriously. And in that respect, um, a recent craze, which I'm alluding to here with this image, uh, within the field of international politics and among policymakers as well, in talking about this Thucydides trap, um, it's it's sort of the latest in a long line of using Thucydides in the the field of international relations. I want to say straight away that, uh, and here I guess. Um, the title reflects um, my interest in um, 
the idea of a subtext, the idea of what can be read between the lines, and in that respect, perhaps reveals my sort of epistemological uh, interests and background a little bit. Because as soon as you write the real Thucydides trap, of course, what you're implying is that there's, uh, I'm about to present the real one, but there's also another one, which obviously in some way is fake. So I'm going to talk about the way the Thucydides trap is presented, and I've already given part of this away by saying that um, I, I don't find it convincing, this trap. But the peculiar thing about this is that there is a kind of trap in the Thucydides trap, because if you are convinced by this, what I would call a sort of delusion, and a uh, dangerous kind of hysterical thinking that I think it that in itself is a trap. The trap, the real trap emerges from the fake trap. And the, the real trap is more dangerous. Um, so what I want to say is that there's a real hazard at work here, and it's a, it's a hazard for all of us, because American policymakers are quite powerful. Uh, if they um, are becoming hysterical about the Chinese threat, and of course it's receded a little bit in the last year or two because of uh, other more obvious concerns, but it remains on the agenda and it is dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous because the conclusion that's usually drawn is that we need to be strong. We need to impede the rise of China if necessary, that we, uh, in other words, can very easily provoke conflict in the, in the interests of being strong, as though that is the way to, uh, the best way to prevent conflict. Um, so I think there's a sort of, um, what I would call a kind of um, presentism at work here. There's an interpretation of Thucydides that is influenced by concerns about the present day. It emerges from the context of the United States in the world, perceptions of the emergence of a rival power in the, in the shape of China, and that some kind of uh, concern about trying to make sense of contemporary conditions is influencing sh and shaping the way antiquity is used. And I would say this is presentist in the way historians understand presentism, where uh, this becomes a kind of distorting lens, where what you see is already kind of predetermined by the expectations that follow from your present environment, and you end up with a rather simplistic interpretation of the past that um, follows from uh, your present concerns. It becomes a kind of mirror of those present concerns. So um, in that respect, I want to talk about how today's statesmen and the influence of international relations tend to see what they expect to see. Uh, when they look at Thucydides as the historian of the Peloponnesian War. But I'm also going to talk about how that works in terms of what they want to see. Because uh, I think something talking about the realm of subtext or what's implicit in these ideas is that there's... Um, there's a, there's a motivated interpretation going on that is operating on actually an emotional level in what we could 
describe as difficult times. We're all fairly aware right now that we're living in difficult times, but maybe we have been living in uh, difficult times for some time. Um, the guy who's really lit a fire under the idea of the Thucydides trap um, is uh, a very old established international relations academic American of the name Graham Allison. Uh, Graham Allison is uh, at Harvard. Um, and uh, yeah. He is, um, let's go right right here. Yeah, I'm holding that backwards. Um, he invokes the Thucydides crap, trap with a, I nearly said Thucydides crap. Uh, that's a Freudian slip. Uh, the Thucydides trap increase, and this quote from, um, from Thucydides uh, early on, so book one, uh, chapter 23, increasing Athenian greatness and the resulting fear among the Lacedaemonians, ooh, let's say the Spartans, made going to war inevitable. And of course, um, American social scientists like inevitability because it sounds suspiciously like a law of behavior. It sounds suspiciously like some kind of natural law that, um, you know, would might emulate, for example, the kind of natural laws that we enjoy observing in the natural sciences. And this effort to emulate the natural sciences is part of the background to this activity. So basically, what Alison is talking about is the danger of power transitions. We've got a powerful actor that dominates international relations, the United States, what uh, international relations, I'll call them IR theorists for short, international relations theorists, they would call a hegemon. And the, when such a hegemon is in the process of being displaced, as the United States possibly is by China, although actually that's become ex um, increasingly doubtful, or at least increasingly doubted, as China starts to have a lot of demographic, economic, and environmental issues. So the idea that China really is going to supersede the United States as the dominant power is by no means clear, actually, but uh, this is often the assumption that writers like uh, Graham Allison made. So yeah, um, it's, a, it's a problem of power transition. These are dangerous because the rising power will challenge the interests of the dominant power. The dominant power will, um, in order to pursue their interests, we'll need to respond to these problems. And what Alison says is that usually the result of this is war. Uh, so not quite completely inevitable, as implied by the quotation from Thucydides out of context, because I don't think uh, Thucydides is making a claim about macro political laws. Uh, what Thucydides is making a claim about is the relationship between the Athenians and the Spartans. Um, but uh, the way it's often interpreted is that it's, oh, here we have, you know, a statement about international relations, the international relations of ancient uh, Greek times. Um, so uh, Graham Allison backs this up with, uh, you know, a fairly typical empirical project in the positivist tradition. When I say positivism, I just mean that tradition in, in, in American social science, especially not limited to the United States, but 
the United States was a major mover behind this from the 1950s onwards, and it remains an enduring influence. And it's not to get bogged down in talking about that because it's a big topic, but in a nutshell, it's about trying to make the social sciences more like the natural sciences. So we need, uh, in the social sciences, when we can't isolate the variables, we need statistically valid uh, data. So what this means in the field of international relations actually is you end up comparing apples and oranges in a very misleading way, because it's the only way you're going to generate a reasonable amount of data that will be valid. So, you know, even then it has a re relatively small number of cases, 16 cases of uh, hegemons being challenged and 12 end up in war. But he's tracing those cases back hundreds of years. And I would say, you know, in the time since uh, the 1600s, we've been through an, a social and political transformation. I don't believe that the relationships at the time of the war of the Spanish succession, for example, are directly comparable in that way with contemporary relations between the United States and China, or going back a bit, the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, and never mind the political and social transformations uh, that make the world pretty much unrecognizable compared to the times of uh, ancient Greece. But anyway, with the help of this evidence, um, uh, Alison makes the claim that war is very likely because of this um, this uh, Thucydides trap. And of course, it sounds more convincing because you invoke an august authority. I mean, the longer ago they were writing, the better, because the more it seems like a deep, profound, historically rooted uh, truth. So I want to rethink this idea of entrapment because um, I don't find it too convincing. I want to just fill it out a little bit in terms of where it comes from in terms of the field of international relations. It's rooted in international relations theory and it's been criticized by uh, some, like Robert Cox, for example, as being maybe a little too practical, a little too convenient for policymakers. In other words, uh, it's not interested in more critical questions, like how did our social and political order emerge? In what ways does our social and political order create winners and losers, Ra rather um, most mainstream international relations scholars are interested in the winners, they're interested in being, you know, in the, in the old fashioned idea, going back to Machiavelli, being advisors to princes. As Cox puts it, theory is always for someone and for some purpose. Uh, and I think that's worth bearing in mind when thinking about the way international relations performs this kind of presentism because it's a certain kind of contemporary interests and concerns that are at work. And you see this on the kind of cultural landscape, the kind of semi popular landscape. There are a couple of these journals that are very important for understanding the direction of American foreign policy, where it comes from and what drives it. One is foreign affairs. There's another one called uh, foreign policy. My old supervisor used to call these town and gown <laughs> journals. If that means anything, you know, the gown that the academic wears, 
um, but the academic now is in town with this journal. So it's not uh, only for scholars. And what you find with these journals is they are read by some policymakers. And even if you know it's a relatively small number of policymakers, it's a grapevine. Word gets around. And these journals are very concerned with American issues, American anxieties about decline. Um, can America ever lead again? How America and China can avoid war? I mean, it's already, you know, talking about reading the, the subtext, it's already assumed that war is on the horizon between China and the United States. So this is the kind of context in which that operates. So the version of presentism you get with international relations, I would call a kind of structuralist distortion. If you're trying to do natural science in the field of uh, social human relationships, what you usually end up talking about is structure. And you do that, first of all, by talking about systems. Because what you need is a realm that's relatively autonomous and relatively robust. You need it to persist over time so that you know there's a reasonable body of data that is generated by that. And you need to think of it as operating in a relatively self-contained way. So you get, I would argue, a kind of structuralist distortion. The, st the, the nuanced history that Thucydides write, writes about emerging relationships between Athens and its allies, Sparta and its allies in the history of the Peloponnesian War becomes a story of an international system. And that goes back quite a long way. It goes back deep into the Cold War. Uh, uh, an influential introductory textbook, uh, International Politics, a Framework for Analysis, compares historical international systems. So the relationship between Greek city-states in this very small regional context is imagined as a kind of universalizing system of international relations, a kind of scale model, really, in, with all that kind of implies. So I think there are, you know, some problems with that, limits to that structuralism. Uh, and I think what's, what's particularly interesting to me, and see if it's interesting to you, is that there's some shared motivations behind that, that emerge from contemporary life. It's fear, it's vanity. You know, talking about the subtext. There's very little talk about terror or fear in mainstream approaches to IR what would I would call the um, so-called realist approaches. Um, it's, a, it's an ironical name for the dominant view in my uh, international relations, in my view, because it's extremely distorting uh, view of the world, but it styles itself as realism. And I would say, yeah, uh, the, at the root of this is um, a kind of sublimated fear and a not too uh, a not too well hidden vanity, which is one of the reasons you might use Thucydides because it sounds impressive, along with Machiavelli, along with Thomas Hobbes, along with Jean Jacques Rousseau. I mean the the history of ideas is thoroughly rifled to provide the kind of forebears of realist ideas. So how this plays out, the wisdom 
uh, I would say that is kind of passed on. And I think, you know, it operates as received wisdom among policymakers. Um, yeah, the, the problem arrives because of an upset of uh, the balance of power. Um, the distribution of power is the most important thing to understand about an international system. And uh, it illustrates perennial tendencies and hazards of system structure. But the most important thing is to understand the deep structure of international relations. The, the organizational principle, if you like, the whole point about international relations being subject to these power dynamics is that international relations lacks an overarching authority in the way that states are governed and ordered by the overarching authority of a sovereign power. So there are differences of power, but they are differences of coercive power and especially military power. So it's not completely decentralized, but it's decentralized in terms of formal authority. And this is what makes international relations inherently competitive, according to this view of realism. And especially that most influential genre of realism, which is sometimes referred to, not surprisingly, as structural realism. So historical teaching um, informs this pre-existing uh, perspective of the, the realist. What Thucydides teaches us is that the rise of Athens is like the rise of China. It's a, another example of this perennial tendency that dominant powers get uh, challenged. And the lesson learned is a kind of um, security paradox. And you, this security dilemma, as it's often called in realist terminology, there is an acknowledgement of the problem that in attempting to uh, show strength, in attempting to shore up your power, uh, you may risk provoking the other side. You may risk a kind of escalation of conflict. But the, the point is that the, according to this perspective, this paradox or dilemma has to be resolved. And analysts tend to err on the side of emphasizing strength to uh, make alliances, build up your military capacities, do what you can to further your own power at the expense of uh, especially your chief rival or chief rivals. So yeah, this is um, a rather simple tale in a way that's told according to this theoretical perspective. And what it does is it makes a number of kind of rather, I think, distorting um, claims about uh, ancient Greece. Uh, treats it as a kind of international system. So in the first place, treats it as relatively autonomous, which is uh, problematic, uh, and treats it as analogous in as much as these entities, the poli, are not the same as modern states. They might be similar in some ways. They may be analogous, but that's something that has to be argued, not taken for granted, as is uh, usually the case. So the units are considered to be analogous and the dynamics of those uh, units of the system 
are sh uh, seen to be synonymous uh, or analogous. And uh, essentially, given a kind of modern uh, interpretation, the, uh, the assumption at the root of this picture of international relations in an anarchical system depends on that very modern idea of actors being self-interested and pursuing those interests in a systematic way. In other words, a kind of model of rationality that in many ways is rooted in modern society and then transposed onto Greek city-states. So uh, in this um, context, this historian becomes a kind of IR theorist, an honorary IR theorist. I mean, there's no way that Thucydides is an IR theorist, but uh, in the most charitable way, we could say that his um, interpretations of what happened in the Peloponnesian War could be interpreted as being uh, consistent in some ways with realist theory. Um, and there is a sort of favorite way of um, getting at this, but um, I think it's worth noting the, the nature of this presentism because the whole idea that we can go back and talk about the international in ancient Greek times uh, is so fundamentally anachronistic that the, the term international was basically coined by Jeremy Bentham towards the end of the 18th century. Uh, and he, he coined it because he wanted uh, a new expression to describe what had then been considered as the law of nations. You know, we don't even think about that anymore because we don't talk about the law of uh, nations anymore. We talk about international law because we followed from Bentham's advice that this would be a more accurate term for encapsulating this realm of law between nation states. So he talks about this in an introduction to the principles of morals and legislation. So I mean that the word international enters the language at the end of the 18th century. The field of international relations or international politics comes nearly 150 years later. There is no field until after the First World War. And really, uh, the, the invention of this field was a response to the World War and a terrible upheaval that that entailed. But um, where is this primarily coming from? I mean, you, you always have to be a little bit careful in terms of the way these rhetorical slates of hand work in academic fields, because um, it's, it's fairly, fairly clear that the, the majority are not going in depth in the materials that they cite as their antecedents or their forefathers. Um, and this applies equally well to some of the other sort of historical authorities that are brought to bear. But what um, seems to be kind of uh, power to the elbow of realists above all, and the one that is usually um, used and read. It crops up in uh, collections, uh, undergraduate texts, and so forth. I mean, they, they will 
make lengthy extracts from the Melian dialogue, this moment in the Peloponnesian War when Athens lays siege to Milos and a kind of dialogue is reconstructed in a kind of um, interpretive way by Thucydides. And he has the Athenians say this, divinity, it would seem, and mankind, as has always been obvious, are under an innate compulsion to rule wherever empowered, without being either the ones who made this law or the first to apply it after it was laid down. We applied it as one in existence when we took it up and one that we will leave behind to endure for all time. Since we know that you and anyone else who attained power like ours would act accordingly. You would do exactly the same in our position and you would act out of human nature. This is the trans-historical reality that uh, this uh, piece of uh, dialogue and, and uh, speculative interpretive piece of dialogue uh, entered into the Peloponnesian War here uh, is um, a sort of uh, confirmation of the quest for enduring laws of behavior. And indeed, when realists talk about structures, they're talking more or less directly about structures that are determined by, by human nature. That uh, when entities relate to one another, uh, human beings will react in a similar way to those structural conditions in accordance, in other words, with some kind of enduring human nature. So what you uh achieve here is a kind of immortalized field, even though the field kind of entered the academic horizon in the middle of the 20th century, it becomes a field which purports to create uh, trans-historical truths, uh, trans-historical laws of behavior. And you know, if you if you're introduced to this field, you know it's, it doesn't it, it it doesn't take long to get the kind of message, the rhetorical message, because realism will be presented with the originators of realism going back to Thucydides, traced through Machiavelli and Thomas Hobbes, even though Thucydides is an historian of the Peloponnesian War, even though Machiavelli is talking about the exigencies of state building, not talking about international relations in general. And Thomas Hobbes in particular is very uninterested in international relations, is talking essentially about the dynamics of inter human relationships uh, and how those uh, help us understand the formation of states, mm -hmm. uh, help us understand why we should uh, obey the laws of the state. So I'm just going to say a little bit about um, the limits of this kind of structuralism. Um, I'm going to do that in two stages. The first is um, how this is distorting in terms of an understanding of ancient Greece uh, and an understanding of Thucydides, 
interpretation of ancient Greece. Um, one is that um, you know, it matters that this is not um, a kind of international system operating in a vacuum. It affects relationships between the poli of uh, classical Greece because there's a, a self-understanding that comes from a sense of the, the place of the Greeks in the world and a very strong sense of Hellenic exceptionalism, that this is special. You know, this is a place where remarkable things are being achieved in contrast to the relatively despised barbarians outside. So this lends those relationships uh, kind of what I would call a kind of paradoxical unity. Um, it's unity, you know, that allows things like the Pan-Hellenic Games where coming together in a common culture, common religious, rites and rituals, for example. But unity is a two-sided thing. Uh, being close to others creates uh, tensions and conflicts, as anybody who's been involved in a family conflict will know, that those relationships create discord, that um, those discords can be all the more bitter because of the Hellenic unity, because there can be an extremely str strong sense of betrayal, a strong sense of treachery uh, in those cases where um, that unity uh, breaks down as it will from time to time. And so, for example, you know, you look at the impetus to the Peloponnesian War, apropos of this story of structural dynamics, one of the one of the triggers of this was the tension that arose between Corinth and Corsia. And uh, a lot of that was because Corsia was originally a Corinthian colony. And there was a sense that there was a proper relationship between the colonizers and the colonists. And uh, that conflict and that violence to be understood how it escalated has to be understood in the context of those very strong dynamics at a relatively small scale between um, people with very close relationships even kinship relationships or relationships that verge on kinship relationships. The scale, of course, is important. Um, and the importance, therefore, of uh, networks, um, dynastic relationships, um, And uh, the, the conditions of these societies and how they operate or operated, which are uh, fundamentally based on relationships of, of domination, uh, enslavement, among other things. And the way in which that dovetails with conflictual antagonistic relationships where honor becomes extremely important. Uh, to what extent are actors guided by systematic pursuit of self-interest, uh, understood in the modern context, usually in terms of some kind of material interest. Here, issues of honor, issues of um, disrespect, for example, can be equally or more important. And piety, 
the, the issue are also tied up with relationships of honor, um, how to do what is perceived to be right in put it in philosophical terms, it's not always about the consequences, it's also about the journey. It's not always about ontological considerations. What are the consequences? But deontological considerations, what are the rules? What are the rights and wrongs of this situation? And Many of these kinds of aspects of the specific historical conditions are easily lost because of the nature of the narrator, a narrator that is firmly embedded in these uh, conditions. So a lot of the considerations at work are often taken for granted because they would be so obvious to a contemporary audience. And then the modern interlocutor, the modern interpreter kind of loses track of those. But the most important limits of this structuralism, and we've called it part two, would be uh, the distorting view of the present that arises from this. The, um, nation states are uh, peculiar entities that are poorly understood by realist theories of international relations, which they overlook when they compare states in the 16th century to states in the 20th. Diverse national cultures, but also where uh, the, the national idea has become extremely important and almost invariably plays a role in, in wars. Wars are not usually primarily about correcting some kind of uh, balance in the structure of the system. It's more likely about connections uh, of nationhood, ethnicity. Uh, this, I would argue, is the major factor behind the war in Ukraine. The, the Russianness of um, citizens of uh, the Ukraine, some of the citizens of the Ukraine, and the, the national history, the idea that Ukraine had been part of a kind of Russian state known as the Soviet Union. And political economic integration, uh, the changes in, in catastrophic and fundamental ways, the dynamics of the interests and the fate of states, the macroecological collapse where we face now with climate change, the destruction of habitat, which is rooted in an um, economic system, which is relatively universal and relatively well integrated, despite the best protectionist efforts of some. And military technological mobilization, which has gone along with the rise of nation states, creating uh, both the kind of misery of total war, but also the paralysis of total war, that it becomes extremely difficult to fight wars with all means at one's disposal and becomes in the context of resistant national territories, extremely difficult to win wars, as we found time and again, Vietnam, Afghanistan, now again in Ukraine. But where it comes from, I think is the most interesting, I realize I've gone on a bit long here, but I'm almost done. The context, I think it's best summed up in the, the title of um, an influential historical study by Eric Hobsbawm, uh, 
age of extremes, the short 20th uh, century, 1914 to 1991. We're look, talking about a period of extraordinary social and political upheaval, revolutions, wars on a scale that has never been seen before, the working out of many of the consequences of the rise of nation states and the industrialization of their means of war that are all in a way um, kind of um, looked askance at by realists. And indeed those other kind of extremities that have become more apparent at the end of the 20th century it's often described by as the uh, the effects of a continuing Anthropocene in terms of the effects of uh, human relationships on a planetary level. So, I mean, I think the sociology of knowledge is interesting in this respect. Uh, what directs it? The, I'm being a little bit flippant here in the interests of brevity. Lifestyles of the rich and famous, the value of social climbing, the discreet charms, of course, of a classical education. You know, when the town and gown writers are meeting and exchanging ideas, it helps that you can dig into your kind of the, the verities of your classical education. But what I think interests me especially is the phenomenology, which is really, you know, a fancy way of saying how it feels. The realists don't talk about fear because they're in denial about their fear. And what they're doing is they're resorting to a kind of nostalgia that makes them feel better. Paradoxically, because what they're talking about is the continual dangers of war, but what they're thinking about is old-fashioned war. They haven't come up to date with their understanding of modern, socialized, mechanized, technological, technologized war. So in that respect, they are kind of sheep in wolves clothing uh closet romantics uh betraying themselves as uh, realists and i'm kind of uh in this respect adapting a quotation of john lennon who wrote a song called which was subsequently seen to be tragically prophetic happiness uh, is a warm gun if there's a kind of bellicosity to realists it follows from a, a warmongering of realists in a way. It follows from a kind of, um, yeah, you know, kind of better the devil you know, better that than acknowledge so that the social political order is fundamentally altered and your assumptions about how it works are no longer applicable. The background for that is uh, the roots of the age of extremes in the Industrial Revolution. There's no better source than Karl Polanyi, the Great Transformation. And for the phenomenology of international relations, what they fear but don't talk about because they're in denial in psychoanalytical terms is Cynthia Weber's uh, excellent critical introduction to international relations theory. And I'm finished, finally, thank you. Thank you for your extremely interesting take on possibilities in modern politics. So any questions for our speaker tonight? Any questions from our online attendants? Can I? Yes, please. All right. 
So we extrapolated political realism uh, of Thucydides, and I will focus on the last part of uh, deconstructive structuralist mm -hmm. uh, part. So this extrapolated political realism, are you claiming that is used uh, as a masking device for a sifting situation, or as a veil that do not, do not allow modern policy makers to see what is really going on? Uh, I think it's I think it's all of those things. Um, uh, what what realists uh, do, and, and I mean, you know, we could talk about the the nostalgia, and of course, I've focused in a way on the nostalgia mm -hmm. for Thucydides. But uh, one of the reasons I put on my final slide uh, all of these. Um, you know, statesmen at the end of the Second World War, is there's a sort of resort to some kind of idealized false memory, in a way. Nostalgia? Yeah, nostalgia for a time that never really was, and, you know, a little bit like the nostalgia of Brexit that the British had for... The, the halcyon days of Britain that never really existed. Um, they're thinking actually mostly about Bismarck. That would be the kind of model. It's the idea that it's relatively predicted relationships of power that you can use your diplomacy and your skill uh, and your uh, judicious use of military capability to achieve your objectives. So Bismarck, uh, Baron von Clausewitz, figures from the 19th century that were already actually, I mean, this is why it's a sort of false nostalgia, because a, uh, a leader like Bismarck was already dealing with uh, the strange problems of establishing a modern nation state in Germany. Clausewitz was already dealing with uh, the, the industrialization and mechanization of war, but that's filtered out. And there we get this sort of rather reassuring model of international relations is just conducted the way it always has been, nothing to worry about. Um, you're not going to think about planetary destruction, either gradual, not so gradually, but a little slower through ecological collapse, or rather suddenly through um, an exchange of nuclear weapons that would, even a relatively small exchange, would impose a nuclear winter that would basically be the end of civilization as we know it. Um, but you don't think about those. You you think about, yeah, a nice old-fashioned game of chess with good old-fashioned uh, statesmen. Other questions? Can you? Oh, I think that I, can I actually? Yeah, please go right ahead. Hmm? No questions. There is a raised hand. Hmm. Anastasia, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, now, yes. What is that? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Yes, we can hear you too. Okay, good. Uh, so, so thank you, Stuart. That was a very interesting uh, uh, lecture and um, uh, and really thought provoking. Uh, um, I would like to ask uh, whether you see any or you put any blame uh, in this on Thucydides, because just playing the the devil's advocate mm. i mm. would say well he brings it upon himself because he both uh, 
historian's voice in his work, mm -hmm. but also some of the speakers, as you, you mentioned, the Million Dialogue, they are making quite big claims about how human history works. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I you know, I really hesitate to blame Thucydides for anything, given how many uh, years ago he lived. Um, <laughs> so I suppose there is that kind of imperative to kind of forgive and forget. But I think mm -hmm. there are aspects of Thucydides that lend themselves Mm. to this problem of distortion. So I think that the, the character of the text plays a role in this. And I mean, I, I was already alluding mm -hmm. to that to some extent in talking about the way in which um, the some of the context, the social and political context is taken for granted. And in that respect, I think, um, you know, he's not unusual in terms of that this is a kind of shorthand of all contemporary commentators, you know, uh, commenting on their own time or the recent past, that they're inclined to take a lot of stuff for granted, which then becomes uh, a source of potential confusion. I think also there's an element here in terms of the way uh, the text is written, uh, that in some respects, um, uh, it, although in his context, Thucydides was very concerned to stake out a kind of field of history, which is about accuracy, which is about fidelity to the facts. But there's no doubt that he's influenced by literary or even oral traditions in Greek culture. So the, the power of embellishment, the power of uh, presenting these kind of elegant formulations that in some respects, uh, even though uh, I think, you know, large parts of uh, the Peloponnesian War were never intended to be recited and they're not written in that way. I think elements are particularly the dialogues. And so there's a way in which um, the, the kind of formulation becomes extreme in a way for rhetorical effect uh, in a kind of literary, a sort of literary form or cultural form, which easily lends itself to misinterpretation, to be in its very extremity, which uh, I think for Thucydides was a kind of device when he presents the Athenian view of, you know, never mind matters of right and wrong, it's all about power and interests. That uh, then becomes a kind of article of theoretical faith for the modern IR scholar. And it partly emerges from that cultural material that this source represents. Does that answer your question in some way? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> Yes. First of all, thank you so much uh, for this epistemological journey. Sorry, very refreshing. Um, it reminds me of the discussions we had in the past. I want to ask you this ontology you pointed out, um, the the way that um, I are functions uh, out of context and in a kind of you know nat naturalizing the present and the past. Can you see that also in other fields? I'm talking broadly about epistemology at the moment and how you know the thought is changing. Can you see mm -hmm. it also in history? For example, I was talking to an academic very recently who is writing something about you know consciousness and ontology in history. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether this kind of shift is it something that happened recently, uh, also in IR. Um, is there a genealogy of you know 
thinking, a uh, shifting of, of thinking about IR in yeah. the last decades? Yeah. Uh, just a short comment and then we yeah. can discuss it. Yeah, I mean, certainly in international relations, the, you know, this has emerged as an issue. I mean, um, I'm alluding to that a little bit with the uh, reference to Robert Cox and talking about this as a kind of problem solving theory, which kind of sets the template in a way for a kind of a historicism that you take the concerns and affairs of, of the present and you you kind of project those into other times as a way of helping you deal with the way of the problems of the present in the in the way that you wish. But I think um you know uh what's important to say about this is that it is rooted in uh a more general problem of history. I mean, there is a general problem of presentism. There's also, in a way, uh, in that context, a more general problem of modernism. The idea that um, the past is rather readily put into this kind of narrative frame of progress. So um, what's kind of interesting about um, this use of Thucydides and international relations, some way it was even more obvious during the Cold War, is that there's another sort of subtextual element here as well, which is, okay, the, the, the type of political systems doesn't matter, but the reason you're afraid going back to the fear that I was talking about, is that it matters, because the American way of life is the best. And if the American way of life is threatened, then that's a serious problem. Uh, and the Athenian life in its way of life in its time was the best. Uh, and that's why the war with Sparta was a problem for Athens, which in a way is the kind of the dominant discourse of Thucydides <clears throat> during the time of the Cold War. Because rather than casting uh, China as Athens, the United States was cast as a kind of analogue of uh, Athens and Sparta as a kind of... Uh, prototype for uh, the totalitarian state of the Soviet Union. So, I mean, there is some work in historiography or the, or the philosophy of history to try and reframe the narrative. I mean, there are even um, historical works that attempt to um, uh, there's one study, in, I can't give you the reference right off the top of my head, but there's one study looking at um, German bureaucratic development in the 19th century. And instead of framing this in the usual way, as uh, steps in the direction of a more fully formed and more rational administrative system, frames it in terms of the Holocaust frames it in terms of the great catastrophe that's coming in the future, and then creates a different kind of framework for interpreting those historical development where you are not automatically assuming that they're positive, progressive, moving us in a certain kind of narrative direction. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> there was, but it was lowered, so no. Yes. Hello. Uh, yes, hello. Um, hello. Uh, thank you for a marvelous lecture. Um, uh could you 
um I, 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 it's really interesting with a um a renewed claim for, for, for the relevance of the very cops bomb a fantastic book um what what would you say that the um uh rise of china and the renewed uh and the renewed um the renewed competition between the the, the great powers. I I I mean in 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 the rough outline, what would be 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 the the Hobbesian, uh, the Hobbesian take on uh, our present predicament? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I mean, um, and and in a way, it kind of brings me back to something I, I would have preferred to have said more about in the talk, but of course, always a, too much in the talk and, and not enough space for to cover always the most important points. Um, I think um, what uh, what emerges from this use of Thucydides and uh, a kind of model of uh, the system of states is that it, it it really kind of irons out these uh, differences, important cultural differences. I mean, you know, you can look at, say, the power transition between uh, the, the Pax Britannica and the Pax Americana, the emergence of the United States taking over as the leading power, very smooth and peaceful. Um, to, everything to do with cultural similarities and commensurability between those places. You cannot take these actors out of the cultural context. And if you look at China, for example, what becomes clear is just that um, Chinese decision-making rarely conforms to the kind of short-term strategic rational actor model that is favored by the United States. So um, if you think about uh, Chinese uh, foreign policy, it's not especially proactive. It's not especially territorially proactive because usually the thinking is much more long term. Uh, and I think you know the you know a good illustration is uh, the issue of Taiwan because it plays into the the importance of nationhood, which is pretty general in the contemporary environment. But the way China handles that is relatively low key. But the way that potentially becomes an incendiary conflict is the way the United States uh, falsely imagines, I believe, that uh, China at any moment could be about to settle that issue through military power. And there's very little evidence in terms of past history or policy culture in China. But at the same time, the United States can provoke China by, for example, these you know, ostentatious shows of support for Taiwan and Taiwanese independence, which they already have, by the way. So it's sort of, it's this way, I think, of pouring oil on troubled water uh, in terms of the the underlying um, culture scape, really, of nation states and national ideas, and this kind of simplistic model, uh, almost like a sort of billiard ball model of states whose interests are naturally going to come into conflict because of their power relationships. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, thank you. It was very, it was really interesting. Um, yes.
Other questions? Yes, no. So let us all thank uh, Dr. Robinson for his marvelous lecture tonight. And we can continue uh, in our reception, asking more questions, Hobbes bombing questions. <laughs> Why not? Thank it's the you. best place for questions. It was definitely. Thank you.